Well, good evening. I'm Myra Oletting, the director here at the Peters Township Library. Welcome on this hot and steamy Monday night. Our parking lot is just, it seems like it's uh, evaporating. But we thank you for coming in this evening. We have a wonderful program in store for you, but of course, I don't want to miss an opportunity to tell you about a few other things that are happening. Uh, coming up in July, last year, we had our um, very world famous Hilgo Aguirre, who is from Colombia, and he is a harpist. And he has a, a foundation called Harping for Harmony, and he, two of his students are coming. So if, you're, if you've never seen a harpist play, it's amazing. They have the longest fingernails you'd ever, you'd ever imagine, but they, uh, that's very much part of the craft. And that'll be on July the 17th, so that's coming up later this month. And on Friday the 13th, if we have any teens in the audience or you have teens in your family, we are having an after hours Harry Potter escape room. And that will be held after hours, so it'll be Friday the 13th, and it will start at, um, where's the time here? 6.30, 6.30 to 8.30, we'll be back in our team room. But the escape room will really take place all through the library with lots of Harry Potter trivia and games, and the team department and the youth services department have been working very hard to make this a lot of fun. So spread the word about the Harry Potter escape room. Then also, on your chairs today, you, saw, you have a lot of materials. That's because uh, Margaret Deitzer, who helped to put this program together, reached out to Washington County Tourism. So we have lots of attractions because our topic tonight, uh, the Whiskey Rebellion, of course, is very much rooted here in our county. So we have lots of materials for you to look at. We also have a representative, Mary Pat, where are you? Mary Pat from Oliver Miller Homestead is here. They're actually having a Whiskey Rebellion Day on Sunday, July the 15th from 1.30 to 4.30. And you'll see the original Miller whiskey still, hear about the whiskey making process, and learn more about the Miller family's involvement in the Whiskey Rebellion. They're going to have some skits performed. That'll begin at 2.30. So take a look. This is located in South Park. If you've not seen the Oliver Miller Homestead, uh, you might want to put that on your calendar as another way to tie in such rich local history that we have. But sometimes we just, we forget about it. And speaking of other history that's surrounding us, this uh, set of panels that you see behind us are provided to us by the Gilder Lehrman Society. It's a foundation which really has, if you've been to our World War I events, we've had them here for also for Abraham Lincoln. But these all relate to Alexander Hamilton. They will just be here on display until Friday. So if you, ha if you have a chance after the program, please come on up and take a look. There's a lot of rich history in that as well. Also at the front table are other materials you're free to check out on Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, <coughs> Federalist Papers, the Constitution, you name it, we have it. One more thing that we have is something we did yesterday, on Saturday at Community Day, we did a Hamilton sing-along, which was a great group of young students who learned some of the, the lyrics of some of the songs and told the story of Hamilton. And we have some leftover booklets. It's not the entire musical, but if you are inclined to learn some of the words to the wonderful songs before it comes to Pittsburgh, which will be next year, 2019. I think it's 2019 that it's coming. So you'll be ahead and you'll be able to, to sing along. Okay, so that's it for my little spiel. I want to tell you a little bit about Todd. Todd DePestino has his BA in History and Philosophy from Boston College and he has an MA and PhD in American History from Yale University. Todd is definitely uh, a friend of the library. He is also the director of the Pittsburgh-based Veterans Breakfast Club, which is another piece of um, uh, information. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, a wonderful magazine. We've been to their events, and many of their uh, veterans come and share. We have a World War II discussion group, which is a fabulous way to share stories and, and learn more. I learn every time I walk in to hear what they have to say. But Todd, they meet is it monthly? Uh, monthly here in the South Hills, yeah. Okay, in the South Hills. So that's another piece of information you can take with you today. And Todd is coming back also on August the 23rd. He's spoken already this year. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Tet Offensive, which it was very um, instrumental in the Vietnam War, a very big event. And so we've had some programs already on that topic, but on August the 23rd, Todd's going to return with some of the veterans and the travelers that went with him back in March. 
They traveled to Vietnam, so it'll be a look at Vietnam in 2018, their impressions uh, of what they saw, and lots of pictures too. So that's another opportunity to get to hear from Todd, so that's on August the 23rd. So stay after, look at the panels, also take a look at these materials, and there's going to be one more event that Todd's going to be uh, helping us with this year, and Mara Kelly, who's the president of the foundation, is going to tell you a little bit about a very exciting event coming up in November. Hi, thank you for letting me say a few words. My name is Maura Kelly, I'm president of the Peters Township Library Foundation, and we um, exist to support the library, both financially and with volunteers. Um, so one of the things we wanted to tell you about, and we've told you about if you've been to other programs, is we have an internationally renowned author, Tim O'Brien, coming on Wednesday, November 7th. Tickets are on sale now for this event. They're $20 for adults, $15 for veterans, and $5 for students. This is a phenomenal book. It's one of seven that he's written. Um, that try to connect the veterans' Vietnam experience um, try to explain it to people who haven't served and actually explain it to people who have served. Um, it is definitely literature, but it's written in the form of a memoir. Todd is going to be instrumental in that program. He's going to be introducing Tim that evening. Um, his, his mission at the Veterans Breakfast Club absolutely connects with the library's mission, which is connecting people and stories. So, which is also Tim O'Brien's message. So if you haven't already gotten t tickets, please do. You can buy tickets here at the circulation desk or you can um, go to our website and there's a link there to buy tickets. Oh, thank you, Carol. Yes, there is a VIP portion of the evening, which is for a higher ticket price, $60. Um, and that will have past hors d'oeuvres, some entertainment, an opportunity to have more of a private book signing with Tim O'Brien. So if you're already a fan or soon to be a fan, you may want to consider getting VIP tickets for that evening. That will be an hour prior to the program that evening. And our venue's at the high school this year because we had to avoid a home stealer game. So thank you. And uh, without further ado, I'll introduce Todd. Thank you, Mara. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yes, you. <laughs> and Mara and Margaret, it's always wonderful coming to Peters Township Library. You guys do such a great job putting on these programs, and to get Tim O'Brien here in Western Pennsylvania to speak is just amazing. I assigned his books for many years in my Vietnam classes at Penn State, and uh, it'll be a thrill to meet him. But I'm here to talk about the Whiskey Rebellion on July 2nd. Today is July 2nd, which actually is our Independence Day. Today, July 2nd, is when Congress voted uh, independence from Great Britain. Not July 4th. And when John Adams wrote to his wife Abigail that this will be a day that will be remembered for generations and celebrated with fireworks and pomp and parade, he was talking about July 2nd. He thought July 2nd would go down in history as our Independence Day. It's just because they got the date wrong on the document that we celebrated July 4th. And people didn't sign until August 2nd, so it's very confusing. But I'm here to talk about the, oh, you know what, before I get to talk about the Whiskey Rebellion, one more commercial, as if you haven't heard enough. Uh, I'm the director of the Veterans Breakfast Club. We get veterans together to share their stories. Public is always invited to all of our events, and I, I always encourage non-veterans like me to attend our events. We hold about 65 of these a year. We hold them in the morning and at night, and I've passed out this uh, propaganda about the Veterans Breakfast Club, which has our schedule through September. And I'm very excited because we have a new venue. We're gonna be having an evening event right across Valley Brook Road here at the uh, at VFW Post 764. Okay. Uh, this will be an evening event. We will provide the food, you buy your own booze, and we will work the room with the microphone and get veterans to share stories. So, George, I'm expecting you to share a story uh, about Vietnam that night because that's your VFW, right? That's your post. So, uh, please do. Everybody's welcome. I hope you can make it. You're invited. This will be Friday, July 20th at 6.30 p.m. But I'm here to talk about the Whiskey Rebellion. The Whiskey Rebellion is the name that we give to a very prolonged, I mean, it went on for three years, uh, and uh, uh, um, a, a prolonged and widespread resistance movement to the federal government 
uh, that was prompted by Alexander Hamilton's excise tax on whiskey, which was passed by Congress in March 1791. And it's actually Hamilton himself who gave the name to the Whiskey Rebellion, I think in, a, in an attempt to diminish its significance. But the whiskey tax was just the spark. There was also fuel that fed the flames. And I think to understand why the Whiskey Rebellion just burned so long and you know, it was such light and heat, you really have to know a couple things about it. Number one, it was a movement of the West. In 1791, Pittsburgh was as far west as you could go. Uh, we were the West, the Trans-Appalachian West. Anything west of the Al uh, Appalachian Mountains uh, is where the Whiskey Rebellion happened. Um, and it happened everywhere. It wasn't just Western Pennsylvania. We tend to think of it as occurring in Western Pennsylvania because this is where we live, and this is where the most dramatic events happen. Uh, but that, this rebellion was from Western New York all the way down to Western Georgia. And Hamilton actually wanted to put the hammer down on the rebellion in Western North Carolina. Uh, but he just felt he couldn't catch him there. <laughs> he had a better chance of catching him here in Western PA and decided to, to declare martial law here in Western PA instead of North Carolina. But it was absolutely widespread in a Western movement. Secondly, it was a movement of poor against rich. Very related to the fact that it was from the West. These were largely poor farmers and poor craftsmen in the West who were rebelling against a uh, wealthier merchant class in the East because these farmers were poor, they thought, because they were indebted. Debt was a major problem in America in the 1790s, a major problem, because money was scarce. Money was scarce from our colonial period up through about the 20th century. Curr we didn't have a good, stable, hard currency for a long time in this country. Uh, and to get good hard currency, you needed it to buy land and to buy equipment. There were certain transactions you just couldn't do without it. So the only people who had money tended to be bankers and merchants on the East Coast, a few people around here like Robert Morris. And, uh, uh, and so you would borrow from them and they paid, they charged very high rates, 10%, uh, 12% interest rates, which was fine when crop yields were good and, and crop, crop prices were high. But when uh, prices fell, this became a crisis. Paying back these, these loans became a real problem. And it didn't take many bad crops or many years of low prices for farmers to fall in arrears and then to finally start losing their land and their property in bankruptcy. It was not uncommon for a head of a household, a poor, poor farmer here in Western Pennsylvania, to languish in debtor's prison while his equipment, his livestock, his furniture was being sold at auction, and then his family finally being put out of the house. One third of all farmers in Western Pennsylvania lost their land between the end of the American Revolution and the beginning of the Whiskey Rebellion. One third. This was a region in crisis. And there was another grievance that these Westerners had, especially here in Pittsburgh, and that was they were frustrated in their attempts to get west. You know, there was more available land in the west in Ohio country, but the Ohio country was already populated by people called Indians, and they didn't want, you know, American settlers coming there, and they put up a fight, and they were being fueled by the British Empire. Uh, and, and then, in addition to that, farmers here couldn't, um, couldn't, had to sell everything back east. They couldn't send it down the Ohio River to Mississippi, and then to New Orleans to sell in the Gulf of Mexico because the Spanish Empire owned New Orleans, and we didn't have a treaty with the Spanish Empire. So there were great frustrations. We always had to turn back and sell everything back east across the Allegheny Mountains, which was ju it just it, it constricted the market. Uh, so into this kind of a tinderbox of grievances and frustrations came our nation's first excise tax. An excise tax is a domestic tax on the production or distribution or consumption of anything. And we, we've never had many of them. We've never had many federal excise taxes because they're, they're so controversial. Nobody likes them. History is written, history is littered, I should say, with uh, rebellions and revolts against excise taxes. Great Britain had plenty of them and from the Middle Ages to the, to the 19th century. Uh, excise taxes are very unpopular. What's, what's much more popular is a tariff. <laughs> it's a more indirect tax. 
So it, for the first easily, the, you know, the first hundred years of our of our existence, well up to about World War One, our federal government was funded by tariffs. Like 80%, 85%, 90, 95%, 98% of federal revenue came from tariffs, taxes on overseas goods. Very little came from excise taxes. Every once in a while, the federal government would put an excise tax on something bad for you. Alcohol, tobacco, anything fun, cars, you know? Uh, those were, that's where the excise taxes were imposed. They were never popular. Uh, so, but Hamilton, this was the first one we ever had. Uh, the first one passed in Hamilton absolutely wanted this thing to be passed. Um, and here in the outlines, it's pretty simple, like the devil's in the details. The outline is the tax was a nine cent tax on every gallon of whiskey anybody produced. That was it. Um, if you, there were, there were options. If, if, you, if you were a giant large distillery, it made a lot of sense for you not to pay that nine gallon, nine cent per gallon tax, but to pay a, ta a flat tax. You could have a flat tax option on everything you produce, but you needed to produce in volume to make that worth your while. And large distilleries chose that option because it brought the per gallon tax down to like five cents, six cents. So this was a tax that favored the large producers and harmed the small producers. How does a federal revenue agent figure out how many gallons of whiskey you're producing? Oh. It meant that you had a revenue inspector travel around the country, take a look at your still, figure out how, much, how many gallons of whiskey this thing could produce if it's working 24 hours a day all year, and that was the amount that they charged you with. Now there was an incentive to overcharge because these revenue collectors were paid uh, one percent uh, for every, for, of everything they collected. So they were collecting on commission, and they would, you know, they would get. But Western Pennsylvania farmers weren't making whiskey full time. This is something they did seasonally and when they had the time. So most Western Pennsylvanians were kind of overpaying. Finally, this tax was payable only in minted coins. Very few of them here in Western PA. Currency was very scarce west of the Allegheny Mountains. Or Bank of the United States banknotes, which were as good as gold, but there weren't many here in Western PA. So all of a sudden, this tax put the Western peoples in a mad scramble for this hard currency that they just couldn't get their hands on. Let me say a few words about whiskey uh, in, uh, in America in the 1790s. It was our national drink. And it was brought here by the Scottish and by the Scots-Irish from Northern Ireland, the Ulster-Irish. Uh, the English didn't touch it, they drank gin. Uh, it was these, the Scots, the Scots, they brought it here. And it quickly became our national drink. There were some regions that didn't drink it. John Adams was a New Englander. He drank um, cider. He had woke up, had a big, tall, what do you call that, stein, a dram, tankard, tankard, that's a rebel for. Big, tall tankard when he woke up and then sipped it the rest of the day. Uh, George Washington preferred rum. Because uh, he was old fashioned. Thomas Jefferson was a snob, so he only drank European wine. And, but everybody else drank whiskey. And in, in the West, man, this absolutely was the drink. Uh, the process of mis making whiskey is this you know, art and mystery that involves chemistry and biology and physics. It's complicated, it involves you know, drying in a kiln, drying grain in a kiln, then heating it with some water. And then uh, finally, the end result is this four kind, different kinds of alcohol that come out of the distillery at the end. Uh, there's the four shot head, run and faint. Man, you've got to get it or in the right combination. If too much four shot, you're a dead man if you drink it. Um, you know, run is what you want, but you want a little bit of everything, I think, from what I understand, just to give you a, a you know, the proper kick. Um, when I say that every Western Pennsylvania, 12 and older, knew at least the basic outlines of this process, which was very complicated. I'm not exaggerating. Uh, whiskey was so important to American society in the 1790s. Uh, people drank a lot of it. Shocking amounts. I mean, it's stunning. I remember being in graduate school and doing some long paper on this kind of 
the subject of the amount of alcohol that Americans drank in the 19th century. And when you do the math, it's really, it's, it's stunning. Because it, it, there were some people who were teetotalers didn't drink any alcohol. Not many, but there were some. So, it, you know, if you take the people who did drink, and then you, if you, uh, uh, you know, take that number and uh, divide it among all the alcohol that was being produced, people were drinking like three shots of whiskey a day on average, seven days a week. You know, they're, they're tanked. <laughs> Much of the time, it's it's really stunning, and you know, of course, it wasn't great for your health. But whiskey would kill you over the long haul. What would kill you in the short term was the water. You know, cholera. It's much better to drink the whiskey, um, and it was also uh, just critically important to the economy of Western Pennsylvania because of the Allegheny Mountains. I mean, you know, the farmers here would grow grain, mainly rye some wheat, and to get that grain back over the mountains to the Marcus in Lancaster and Philadelphia was so arduous and expensive. I mean, it would take you two weeks to travel from Western PA to Philadelphia. Uh, it, whiskey was a great way of getting that grain over the mountains. You know, you take 1,200 pounds of grain and you distill it into 160 pounds of whiskey. Now you can put that on a mule and take it to the markets in, in Philadelphia. Uh, and in Philadelphia, when you took the Forbes Road or you know, you know, whatever road it, you, you took uh, to get to Philadelphia, once you got your whiskey there, man, you could sell it for a high price. It sold for like a buck a gallon. It was, it, Monongahela Rye was considered for a long time in this country absolutely the primo alcohol in North America. This was where the best alcohol was made. It was Monongahela Rye. With the whiskey produces it, tries to reproduce uh, the same kind of alcohol that was made here and drank here in the 1790s. I gave it. I told the saying that I gave this talk at a reti local retirement community and brought a bottle and had to have everybody, you know, wanted everybody to sip a little bit. And there were guys coming three or four times. You know? <laughs> um, and, and not many people liked it as much as bourbon. But this was absolutely considered. Uh, the first rate, I mean, it would sell for 25 cents a gallon here, but a buck a gallon in Philadelphia. And people debated why the water must be good here, or the rain, or I think it was the casks. You know, when they made it in Philadelphia, they made it and drank it. When they made it here, they made it and drank it. But when you put it in cask and it, you jostled it over the mountains, uh, it was it could receive those tannins and whatever else is in the in the casks, and it added a kind of a you know a, a flavor to the whiskey that local whiskeys didn't have. So I think that's what made it made it the primo whiskey. It currency being so scarce, whiskey was a common mode of exchange, a medium of exchange, I should say. It was currency, and there were all kinds of different sizes of barrels that you would use. You know, the five dollar. Uh, here's five bucks in whiskey, here's ten bucks in whiskey, here's twenty bucks in whiskey. When you hired somebody who'd like to work on your farm, it was not uncommon to pay them in whiskey. When you hired a, a pastor, you know, to preach at your church, you paid them in whiskey. And if you think about it, whiskey was a really good currency because it, did, it didn't spoil. It got better with age, you know, it appreciated. Uh, and you could measure it out pretty easily. So it was a commonly used currency. So Western Pennsylvanians, because we didn't have many of these good banknotes back in the United States banknotes, um, Western Pennsylvania argue, argued that this excise tax on whiskey is actually an income tax, which was banned in the Constitution. Uh, you weren't allowed to collect federal income tax. So um, uh, they argued that this was effectively a tax on their income, and it was a steep tax. The average farm family paid about six bucks a year, were owed, they didn't pay it, nobody paid this tax. They owed six bucks a year, which is a lot considering that the average family made about 20 bucks a year. You know, it's like a 30% tax on their income. So that is why Western Pennsylvanians, among other Westerners, reacted so quickly and so fiercely to this excise tax. And Western Pennsylvanians, uh, they, replicated what was done in the American Revolution. They saw themselves as reliving or reenacting the drama of the revolution, the drama of their conflict with Great Britain in the 1770s and 1780s. And one of the first things they did is they created a paramilitary organization, an underground paramilitary organization, a vigilante organization, much like the Sons of Liberty, 
And they were called the Mingo Creek Association, or the Mingo Boys, because they met at this church, the Mingo Creek Church, uh, which is still there. I mean, the original church was absolutely on this site here on Route 88, south of Finleyville and Traps Farms. And it's still there, you know, eight miles from here or so, southeast from here. And uh, they, you know, very quickly, they knew the drill. They had been, they had been resisting tax collection for a long time, property tax collection. So they, they knew what to do. They, they, they uh, called together a quick militia, and they quickly declared the excise tax null and void here in Western Pennsylvania. They decided to shut down the courts, and they proceeded to patrol to stop any uh, tax collector from collecting the tax. And the first tax collector to be stopped was this poor old guy, Robert Johnson, who was walking through the woods. He was a deputy tax collector, walking through the woods near Pigeon Creek in Washington County, uh, on his way to start inspecting some stills. And he was stopped by some Mingo boys, who were dressed as women, <laughs> with their faces blackened which is a tradition that goes back to Robin Hood, you know, the Robin Hood, just the peasants, blackening your face to keep your anonymity. And uh, they stopped poor Robert Johnson. They took away his horse. I think he had a horse. They stripped him naked. They tarred and feathered him, and I think they tied him loosely to a tree. And uh, Robert Johnson got loose, and he walked, he had a very unhappy walk, um, to a federal court. He knew who all these guys were. I think there were 16 of these guys. He knew, he could identify who they were. And he went to a federal court and identified who they were. And a federal marshal went out to start arresting them. And then he got stopped, stripped naked, tarred and feathered, tied to a tree. <laughs> and no, no taxes were collected. The governor of Pennsylvania supported the rebels and agreed that the, uh, you know, federal, that the excise tax should be nullified here in Western Pennsylvania. And the principle of nullification was very much in vogue here in Western PA. And that was the vigilante response. If you remember your history of the American Revolution, there's a two-pronged response to the British. One is the underground paramilitary vigilante response to Sons of Liberty, and then one is the much more official realm of petitioning and you know, grievance issuing, the silk stocking approach, which is where you have a Congress and you have a secretary recording minutes. Well, we did that here too. Uh, there was an official convention, one held at Redstone Fort in Brownsville, and one held at the sign of the Green Tree Tavern, which uh, is on what, is, which was where what is now Fort Pitt Boulevard. And so here's a picture of where it is. And in this, in this convention, they functioned much like the First Continental Congress. And that's how they saw themselves, as reenacting the First Continental Congress. They list their grievances with the excise tax, they send their petition, just like we sent a petition to King George III with the grievances, please relieve us of our grievances. They send it to the governor, they send it to the state house, and they send it to the capital of Philadelphia. And, uh, they, and these were the principles of the convention. Albert Gallatin, who had been in the PA uh, State Assembly, he, had, he was a, a staunch Jeffersonian, he had opposed the US Constitution, and uh, he had also won a seat in the U.S. Senate, but along party lines, the anti-Jeffersonians denied him the seat, saying that he had not been in the United States long enough because he was a, a Swiss immigrant. Um, William Finley, who was our first congressman here in Western Pennsylvania, and his district, the 11th district, ranged from Erie, north, all the way to the Maryland border, and then east to uh, Westmoreland County. And then there was this really interesting guy, Hugh Henry Brackenridge, whose name might be vaguely familiar. I have a niece who goes to Pitt, and she said, oh, I'm living in Brackenridge Hall next year. And I said, oh, Hugh Henry Brackenridge, isn't he an interesting guy? And she said, what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> um, Hugh Henry Brackenridge is not a household word. He kind of should be in Pittsburgh because he founded so many things. He was from, I think, Philadelphia, that area, eastern part of the state. And he became a lawyer, and there were way too many lawyers in Philadelphia, so he came to this village of Pittsburgh in like 1781 when there were 400 people living in Pittsburgh. And, uh, and he started getting really busy. He founded, he should be considered the founder of Allegheny County, splitting off from Westmoreland County. He founded the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. He founded the University of Pittsburgh. And he wrote a really bad novel, and, uh, and also then a very dramatic defense of his role in the Whiskey Rebellion right after the rebellion. These were the three guys who kind of put forth the moderate petition to Secretary Hamilton 
and to uh, uh, President George Washington. And what they received in response was an agreement that they would cut down the excise tax by one cent. Not good enough. It was like King George, you know, ignoring the Olive Branch Petition. And when that happened, when King George ignored the Olive Branch Petition or denied the Olive Branch Petition in 1775, what happened? The colonists reconvened into a second Continental Congress, this time more radical. This time they declared independence, and that's very much what this second convention did. They met at the sign of the Green Tree Tavern again, and this time it was led by this guy who became quite, quite radical, David Bradford. He was an attorney from Washington County. The Brad David Bradford House is still there. And at this meeting, they kind of said the federal government is null and void here. We're going to take over the courts. We're going to shut down the courts. Um, we, we will become the Mingo Creek Association. We'll become the government in effect here. And they didn't officially declare secession from the United States of America, but man, they came really, really close. And they decided to put on watch. And they would, uh, their militia, which would now be much more, much bigger and more active, they would, number one, stop anyone trying to collect the tax. Number two, they would harass and intimidate and stop anyone agreeing to rent an office to tax collectors. There were plenty of people who wanted to give them office space to set up their tax collecting office. Uh, and then third, they would prevent anyone in Western Pennsylvania for allowing any revenue agent to even inspect their still. So in other words, if it was rumored that there was a farmer who was willing to allow an inspection agent to come and inspect their still, that farmer could be expected to receive a visit from Tom the Tinker. Tom the Tinker, he was like Robin Hood. He was everybody and nobody. He was uh, an anonymous character. It was a joke. A tinker was an itinerant repair person. And so, uh, you know, notices were put in the paper. If you register your still with the federal government, you, you could expect Tom the Tinker to come and repair, re mend your still, which means that shoot it full of holes, you know, ruin it. Uh, so, in other words, there was absolutely uh, a, a shutdown of, of federal tax collecting efforts. And I think we here, we wouldn't be assembled talking about the Whiskey Rebellion today, um, as they are not doing, I'm sure, in Western New York or Western Georgia where the rebellion did take place. The reason we're talking about it tonight is because of this guy, General John Neville. He's the one who pressed the issue. And I know we have some experts on the Whiskey Rebellion here tonight. We have some wonderful reenactors uh, from South Park, from the Oliver Miller Homestead, the director of the Oliver, Oliver Miller Homestead. And I, I think that people here know a lot more than I do about the Whiskey Rebellion. And for the life of me, maybe, maybe they could answer the question, why the, why the heck did this guy put up such a fight to collect the whiskey tax? I, I really can't quite figure that out. Um, he's the one who was absolutely determined to collect this tax. He was not, you can't say that he was an unpopular guy here in Western PA. Uh, he's an interesting guy and he was very unusual. He stuck out for a lot of reasons. He was not like, he was not like anybody else. He had grown up in an aristocratic Virginia family. He had served in the military in the French and Indian War in the American Revolution as a general. He was a friends with George Washington. Uh, he moved to Western Pennsylvania because this is where the opportunity was. He was convinced. And uh, man, he became the wealthiest man by far in Western Pennsylvania. He might have been the wealthiest man west of the Appalachian Mountains in the 1780s and 1790s. He was unlike other people here. Everybody here was an anti-federalist. Everybody here didn't like the US Constitution, didn't want it to be ratified, which I would argue the majority of the American people didn't want that thing. Um, he was a Federalist among anti-Federalists. Everybody here was Presbyterian. He was an Episcopalian, an Anglican. Um, uh, very few people here were slave owners. He owned a lot of them, and they worked on his 10,000 acre farm. Uh, he had things that nobody else had, like windows, <laughs> plaster, paintings, books, Stuff like that, you know. Uh, he was a wealthy guy. He had two houses, one big house at Bower Hill, where 
like the JCC in Providence Point is today, Our Lady of Grace on, the, on that hillside right there. And then you get a house down in town in, in Pittsburgh also. Uh, there is no existing portrait of him, I don't believe. There should be. It must have been destroyed in the rebellion. I think the only thing uh, lasting is this uh, silhouette of, of Neville. He had a really great business operation here in Western Pennsylvania. He had cornered every market you could think of. You name it, he made it. Glass, yes. Bricks, pottery. Um, he had an iron forge. Uh, he made it all here to sell. He grew, made whiskey, of course. He had a big distillery. Uh, he had, grew a lot of grain. And he had two customers. One, those heading further down the Ohio River who would sell them whatever they needed. And two, and this was his inn, he was the supplier for these two federal forts in Pittsburgh, Fort Pitt at the point, and, uh, which was a soggy old mess by the 1790s, and uh, Fort Fayette in the cultural district. It just so happened that his brother-in-law, Abraham Kirkpatrick, was the chief of commissary for the U.S. Army, and his son-in-law, Isaac Craig, was the quartermaster for the U.S. Army. So it was the Neville connection. I mean, he was connected, and he was a very wealthy man. And for some reason, he was absolutely determined, I am going to be named revenue inspector for the Western District, and I'm going to collect that tax. And here he is, putting the country on notice that he's going to do it in May 1794. Uh, I'm setting up offices, and I am going to collect this tax. And in his effort to collect, he uh, got the help of a federal marshal named David Lennox, which these two, one of you David Lennox, you're, you're William Miller. Yeah, is Lennox here tonight? There you are, look at him! General Neville. Oh, you're such a nasty guy. What was your problem? Um, Lennox is a federal marshal and he comes with 60 writs or subpoenas for farmers that they know are delinquent in the tax. And he's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna um, issue or, what's the word? Serve, serve these subpoenas. Uh, and, and he's riding the country looking for these 60 addresses, people to you know, serve the subpoena. Neville says, I'll ride along with you, we'll find these people. And on uh, July 15th, they ride up to this house where they encounter William Miller. And uh, William Bain, you know, knock on the door, and Miller's out in the fields. You guys, you do such a great job reenacting this moment on the 15th. And I do encourage you to go on Sunday, yeah. Sunday, July 15th, and see it's a heck of a lot of fun. It's really neat. And uh, Miller comes from the field, and he says, what are you guys doing? And they said, we're here to you know, serve you a subpoena uh, because you haven't paid your tax. And he's like, I haven't paid my, he, you know, John, I'm your cousin. They were related somehow, right? I'm related to marriage. I'm related to you. I move into Kentucky. That's why I haven't registered my still. You, you, you guys are all mistaken. They get, they get into this heated argument on the front porch, and off from the tree line, shots are fired. The Mingo boys are in those woods, firing warning shots out. Lennox turns around, shouts something into the woods. You know, you guys come out, show yourselves, you know, don't be cowards, something like that. The guys come out, and they have this shouting match back and forth. And this is my favorite detail of this great day, of this great encounter. Um, they start shouting back and forth. And David Lennox says, um, can you repeat that? I didn't understand what you said. And the rebels repeat what they said. And Lennox says, could you slow down? Say it again. I can't understand. And he would go back and report later, David Lennox, that he that the Western Pennsylvania accent is so thick <laughs> that you can't understand what these people are talking about ever. It's the Pittsburgh accent in action. So Lennox and Neville take off, and uh, there's, a, there's a meeting of the Mingo Creek boys. You know, what do we do? And they quickly come to a decision that uh, David Lennox has to be arrested because he's representing, he says, he claims to be representing courts that are no longer active in Western Pennsylvania. And so he's, he's not operating under lawful authority. He's probably at the Neville House, and so we're gonna go arrest him. And here's the, here is the um, historical marker at Bower Hill, where Neville's house was. There is a reenactment every once in a while, I think, I don't think it's every year, is it? At, we're at the property near Our Lady of Grace off Bower Hill Road, and then there's a uh, bad bourbon whiskey called uh, Bower Hill. Uh, 
named after this battle. And uh, so about 50 of these Mingo Creek boys show up armed at uh, Neville's house. And they shout, you know, we want you to release Lennox. And there's some shouting back and forth, and um, some uh, shots are fired, and uh, one, uh, somebody's in the house shooting out, and they hit William Miller's nephew, Oliver. They kill him dead. <coughs> so the rebels start shooting into the house, and somehow there's enough guys in the house to fend off these 50 people surrounding Bower Hill. Turns out, there was one shooter in that house, and it was John Neville. He was that good. He was that good at defending a siege, defending his house. I think the only other people in the house were his wife, maybe a friend of hers, maybe a granddaughter or two. Uh, there may have been only other women in the house. And it's, uh, this episode is, and the 50 militiamen who are surrounding Bower Hill are chased off. This episode is often used to show how ineffective and kind of buffoons the rebels were. But I don't think that's what this shows. I think what this shows is how good American settlers on the West were at defending their homes. You know, I mean, we have fire drills today in school. Uh, they had Indian raid drills back in the 1790s, 1780s, because Indian raids were terrifying and they were common. And every member of the household had to play the role. So these girls were reloading rifles and putting them up at the windows, various windows of the house, while Neville ran around shooting at the different, out the different windows to make it seem like there were more people in the house than there were. Uh, Americans, one thing Americans didn't do in the 1780s and 90s was to lay siege on a house. They defended homes that they didn't lay. So I think the 50 militiamen didn't really know what they were doing. Uh, so the, the guys, they retreat to, and there's a big dramatic meeting at Fort Couch. Fort Couch was where you went, was built for when Native Americans came into the territory to raid homes. When you knew there was a raid coming, you hid and everybody gathered in Fort Couch, which was a protective place. Fort Couch was where McDonald's is today on Fort Couch Road. Some of you may be old enough uh, to remember what was there before McDonald's. It was the Pioneer Inn. Yeah. And there was a big fireplace there. I, I barely remember this. And that fireplace was part of the foundation of the original Fort Couch. And I think the foundation of the Pioneer Inn was the foundation of the fort. Well, this is where the meeting was. And it was at this meeting that it was decided that they had to return to Neville's house. And they wanted, they were going to demand John Neville's resignation as a tax collector. And also they wanted Neville to hand over those 60 subpoenas so that they could burn them. These, this was not a crazed, you know, torch and pitchfork mob. They had, you know, they had kind of limited demands, but they had a large militia. They got word that there was gonna be a US Army detachment at the house. So they made sure that they put a broader call out for a militia, and they got 600 men to assemble at Bower Hill the next day, uh, July 17, 1794. Uh, there were some attempts at negotiation. I think the people in the house sent out, Neville was at home, but uh, I think his brother-in-law, Patrick, was there, the, the army captain, I think he was. I think they sent some women out of the, out of the house, and then shots were fired, and um, uh, somebody waved a white flag out of the house, meaning that there should be a truce and another attempt at negotiations. James McFarland, who was the head of the 600 militiamen there on, the, on Bower Hill, he was a uh, Revolutionary War captain, he stepped out from behind a tree and was shot dead. This inflamed the crowd surrounding Bower Hill. They started to lay, put fire to the outbuildings around the farm, and, and then they started to burn the house itself. Uh, slaves were inside shooting out, and the slaves came out and said, hey, can you like leave our buildings alone? <laughs> and uh, the rebels said, yeah, that's fine. And so they, they <coughs> ransacked the home and burned it to the ground. Um, this was the second battle of Bower Hill. After the second battle of Bower Hill, there was a mass very important meeting at the Mingo Creek Association Church five days later. Uh, this is where really David Bradford and the crowd all but declared independence from the United States of America. All but seceded from the United States of America. 
They did declare that, uh, again, the federal government was null and void. Uh, they were going to put feelers out to Western Virginia, especially Kentucky, Western New York, try and create a large regional army or militia, and then proceed to have discussions about whether they should secede and become an independent country. That might be called West Sylvania. There had been talk about creating a West Sylvania with Pittsburgh as the capital since the 1770s. There was also talk about reaching out to the Spanish Empire. Maybe they would accept us. Maybe the British Empire would accept us. But they were done with the US. You know, they, that, that was not going to happen. David Bradford at this time was being called the Robespierre of the West. Robespierre was much in the news because he was the dictator who had taken control of France during the French Revolution. And Robespierre made famous the use of that device that comes down and chops off heads, a guillotine. And, uh, and so there was much talk of that. This is um, James McFarland's grave, which is still there at the Mingo Creek Cemetery. Hugh Henry Brackenridge was at this meeting. And he was an attorney. He was a Federalist also. And he said, he talked. He was a brave man to talk at this meeting. He said, just so you're all aware, I want to let you guys know of two things. First of all, Congress passed something two years ago called the Militia Act that allows the federal government to federalize state militias. And they are, under the Constitution, allowed to bring the US Army here to Western Pennsylvania and put us under martial law. Second of all, and he said, I think that's what they're going to do. Second of all, when they do that, all of us are going to be tried for treason. I think the people in that room didn't understand this. If you think about it, it's 1794. The US Constitution is only five years old. We had come from a place where you were allowed to declare independence from rulers you no longer recognized. I think they saw that it was absolutely their right to kind of step out of the Union when they wanted. Uh, Brackenridge was telling them, no, it isn't. You know, you, you could be put on trial for treason. There was a kind of uneasy feeling that spread through the room. But they overcame it because they had a big plan. The big plan was in order to kind of the final step in seizing power here in Western Pennsylvania was to occupy Pittsburgh because of the whole region, Pittsburgh was the most federalist part of the region. There were only about a thousand people living there, but they were all connected to the federal government in one way or the other, to the army, to the post office, to the courts, you know, they, they were all connected somehow. And so Pittsburgh was seen as the den of iniquity. Pittsburgh was seen as the, the seat of federal power here in the West. So a concerted effort was to take over the city of Pittsburgh. And here was the plan. They would meet at Braddock's Field, where Braddock is today, and they would put a call out to all the regional militias, all the local militias, as many as they could. They wanted a strong contingent there on August 1st and 2nd, Bring your weapon, Thank you, bring ammunition, and bring four days food. That was the plan. And we will march on Pittsburgh, and if there is any resistance, we will burn it down. That was the plan. So, if you can imagine, Pittsburgh is a city of 1,000 people. Allegheny County is a county of maybe 10,000 people. On August 1st, 5,000 to 7,000 men assembled at Traffic's Field. Huge number of people, armed and ready to go. David Bradford showed up on a white horse in a uniform that he had custom made with feathers and plumes and everything. And he was ready to lead this army. Uh, Hugh Henry Brackenridge was also there, kind of as his assistant. Uh, Brackenridge had done something smart. He feared very much for just how radical the Robespierre of the West was going to get. And so he had spent the previous few days in Pittsburgh kind of preparing the city for the siege that they were going to be under. He said, lock your doors, bury your valuables, and start preparing food and rolling out those barrels of whiskey. I want you to deliver the food to an open field with the whiskey, and I'm going to deliver the army to the field. So the next day on August 2nd, uh, this 5,000-man army, 7,000-man army started the eight or nine-mile march down Braddock's Field Road toward Pittsburgh. They were stretched out two miles. They're banging a drum, 
they're singing songs. They come in from the uh, Braxfield Road right down 4th Avenue, which is like still, you know, the same road that's there today. And they march right down and Bracken Ridge deliberately steers them away from Fort Fayette. There was a lot of talk in the camp about Fort Fayette. Rumors, went, that was gonna be an objective because there was an arsenal there. But rumors circulated that there was gold buried at Fort Fayette. <laughs> and they were gonna get there and pick up the gold. He turns left on Market Street, turns the army left, and then a left again on Water Street, past the side of the Green Tree Tavern. And it's here in this open field where like the county jail is today, that was laid out table upon table upon table of a banquet of food with as much whiskey as these guys can drink. <laughs> if you think about it, it was August, it was hot, they had just marched 10 miles, and here they were given the best dinner and drink that they could possibly get. And Brackenridge also made sure that every boat, every ferry was available to be lined up on this side of the Monongahela River. And when these guys had enough to drink and enough to eat, they would be loaded into the boats, taken across the river to the south side, and the ferries would return to Pittsburgh so nobody could come back <laughs> to the city. <clears throat> Hugh Henry Brackenridge saved Pittsburgh that day with this plan. It worked. Back in Philadelphia, Alexander Hamilton was furious when he heard about the attack on Neville's house and about the march on Pittsburgh, and he convinced the president, the president could, could deny Hamilton nothing, ever. And so when Hamilton said, you know, we need to march a 15,000 man army and occupy Western Pennsylvania, the president said, sure. Uh, keep in mind, Alexander Hamilton is Secretary of the Treasury at this time, but he had a way of meddling in everybody else's business and he took over essentially the War Department at this time, and he split the army into two groups. The one would take the northern route, kind of the route to the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Uh, that would be led by Washington himself up to Bedford, and then Colonel Hamilton would take it from there. Uh, and then the southern contingent would be led by General Henry uh, Lighthorse Harry Lee, who was Robert E. Lee's father. And the two armies, the two wings of the army, by the time they got here, there were 13,000 of them, the two wings of the army would meet at about McKeesport and then march on Pittsburgh together, which is what they did in um, September uh, and in October of uh, 1794. And when they came here, Hamilton set up shop downtown and he wanted heads to roll. He was angry. He wanted high profile targets. He was obsessed with having uh, kind of prestige targets. He wanted to arrest and try Hugh Henry Brackenridge. Absolutely. Albert Gallatin, who was opposed to everything Hamilton ever did, he absolutely wanted him in prison. Uh, and same with William Finley, threatened Finley with treason charges. And you can see he, he wrote in a letter while he was here in Pittsburgh, tomorrow the measures for apprehending persons and seizing stills will be carried into effect. I hope there will be found characters, fit examples, uh, fit for examples who could be made so. Colonel Hamilton, unrelated sheriff, is now at our quarters, come to make a voluntary surrender of himself. It is not yet certain how much can be proved against him, but otherwise he is a very fit subject. But he's high profile, he's a sheriff. Uh, as the army approached, most of the rebels saw the size of this army and left, fled, 2,000. 2,000 Western Pennsylvanians got in flatboats and sailed uh, down the Ohio River as far as they can go. Most of them settled in Kentucky. Uh, but the night of the dragnet was November 11, 1794. This night would be remembered in Pittsburgh for generations, literally, as the dreadful night. We've forgotten all about it because, you know, we had other things going on after this date, a lot of other things that, you know, the, Homestead strike and many, many other things. Uh, but for a couple generations at least, this was very vividly remembered and it, it deeply grieved here in Western Pennsylvania. This was the night where the U.S. Army fanned out across the region, broke down doors, and dragged out of beds, beginning at about 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, 300 Western Pennsylvanians who were accused of dodging the whiskey tax and fomenting rebellion against the federal government. 
They were dragged out in the middle of the night, screaming children, crying wives. They were thrown into, uh, into cellars, uh, unheated cellars in a November night. They were put into pens, and they were left in the dark for days, 10 days, without shoes, many of them, until finally they were dragged to a court and they appeared before a federal judge who reviewed every case. And Hamilton told the federal judge, find the best cases, high profile examples, and we'll try them in Philadelphia. They were dragged in one after the other. The judge would look over the information, say, case dismissed, there's no evidence against this guy. There's no charge. Who is this person? You know, person after person after person. Finally, Hamilton intervened and said, just give me 20. <laughs> so the judge took 20. He took 20 out of, the, out of the 300 or so. Those 20 were marched across the state 300 miles to Philadelphia. It took them two weeks in the winter. They arrived in Philadelphia uh, on Christmas Day, where they, per they were paraded down the main road, past the president's house, and this is the remnants of the president's house today. The president apparently came out to review the prisoners, 20,000 Philadelphians who hated Pittsburghers, hated Western Pennsylvania. I mean, this, yes, absolutely. I mean, this was, you know, this was, this rivalry goes way back. Um, uh, you know, just, you know, jeered at the prisoners. The prisoners were taken in front of a grand jury who immediately dismissed charges against eight of them. Twelve of them were remanded to trial. Ten of those were acquitted, with no evidence. And two of them were found guilty of treason and sentenced to death. And those two were Philip Weigel, or Weigel, Wiggle Whiskey, why it's named after him, and John Mitchell, and in the end, the president pardoned both of them. And they were sent back to Western Pennsylvania. Uh, that was the end of the Whiskey Rebellion, this long burning, you know, slow fuse rebellion of the West. And what's just a, it's, it's an accident of history in many ways, that almost immediately after the rebellion was over, things got better in Western Pennsylvania. Our grievances went away. You know, even before the trials, uh, word came that Matt Anthony Wayne had won a big battle against the Indians in Toledo, the Battle of Fallen Timbers, opening Ohio to Western Southern. Uh, the next year, the federal government negotiated a treaty with the Spanish Empire, allowing Western Pennsylvanians to sell their wares down the Mississippi River to the Gulf of Mexico. The federal uh, army, the US Army, uh, stayed here in Pittsburgh because they didn't quite trust Western Pennsylvania. And those 1,500 soldiers were paid in hard currency. So now Western Pennsylvania has some good hard currency to use. Things got better, and to top it all off, their hero, Thomas Jefferson, is elected president in 1800. And this is kind of hard to believe, but when Jefferson ran for president, he received 100% of the vote in Allegheny County. <laughs> 100%. Uh, Westmoreland County, which was not nearly as pro-Jeffersonian, he only received 90% of the vote, if you can believe it. Jefferson had been opposed to the whiskey tax from the beginning. He said the first error was to pass it, the second was to enforce it, and the third was to make it the means of splitting this union. Uh, he had the excise tax on whiskey repealed, which was fine. Pittsburghers didn't pay the tax anyhow. They became moonshiners. They hid their stills in the woods. They, nobody ever paid this tax. Um, whatever happened to these guys, John Neville decided not to rebuild at Bower Hill. His house burned down. He decided to buy Montour Island from an Indian guy named Andrew Montour, and he renamed it. Yeah. You bet, Neville Island. David Bradford fled Western Pennsylvania. He went all the way down the Mississippi River, lived out the rest of his day, became a fugitive from justice. Uh, Jefferson pardoned him. Uh, he spent out the rest of his days in Louisiana by you, Sarah. Hugh Henry Brackenridge, almost arrested for treason, wrote a self-defense after the Whiskey Rebellion. He ended up serving as a, as a uh, Supreme Court Justice of the state of Pennsylvania. <coughs> William Finley went on to serve another 20 years easy as our congressman here in Western Pennsylvania. And Albert Gallatin got the greatest revenge of all. Uh, he became, he stepped into Alexander Hamilton's job as Secretary of the Treasury, and still is our longest serving Secretary of the Treasury. So that's the story of the Whiskey Rebellion. I think there's another mic, and I want to ask these experts what I got wrong. Oh, you're local?
our local reenactors. Yeah, because they know so much about this. Can, can we just anything wrong, but I know this on the sign for Flower Hill, that they have all the millers and revelators. And if you read some of the old history, and you read the history, especially the Can you take the mic? This is good. <laughs> so if you read uh, some, some of the old histories, right here it says two opposition leaders, Oliver Miller, and the, underneath that it says James McFarland. Now, we didn't find out at the Oliver Miller homestead until 1992 that the Oliver Miller who died in the Whiskey Rebellion was actually not the original Oliver Miller. He died in 1782. His will was will number one in Washington County Courthouse. Uh, so we always thought after that, we knew that. We thought it was maybe Oliver Jr., one of his sons. He had six sons. Oliver Jr. was the whiskey runner. He was the one that, who inherited the still and um, the, the land that the still was on and wood, and he um, distilled whiskey and was a pack horse runner. Well, then we found out in 1992 that he actually died in 1783. So after he died, he, he died in debt. His brother, William, bought the still from his estate. And it was William who was st distilling whiskey at the time of the Whiskey Rebellion. And the only Oliver Miller who was left in the area was his, the oldest brother, Alexander's teenage son, who would have been about 16 at the time. I think you need to map this out for me. So, so he was not an opposition leader. He was Oliver Miller who was killed at Neville's house, but not an opposition leader. But that's what was thought up until 1992. Wow, how interesting. And then after Oliver left, or not Oliver, William left to go to Kentucky, which he did do before the uh, army got here, he left the still behind with his brother James, and we have that still. And you have that still? Yeah, that still is there. That is so cool. Just to go and see the still, really. And there was something that I learned from Reverend Roberts, that at the Bradford House, there is, isn't there a letter from Alexander Hamilton on the wall? Oh, a picture. Stand up and tell them about that because oh, that's good. That sounds it's good. kind of a neat thing. He, I learned this from him. I mean, I just happened to take a tour back in January you know, down there uh, at the, in, right on in Washington County, but uh, at the Bradford House, and I guess uh, in the back there's a uh, uh, kind of a bar or kind of a tavern, uh, and on the wall above the fireplace is Alexander Hill picture that's upside down. <laughs> and I said, well, why is it upside down? Because they hated Hamilton. Oh, they hated him. And that was, uh, yeah, the, the, most, uh, the most disappointing thing you could do, you know, to disparage someone who's turned their picture upside yeah. down. Yeah. It, it is so, you know, I, I have uh, daughters who are, love the musical Hamilton, <coughs> and they know every word to every song, and it's a wonderful musical. I, I love it, too. And Hamilton's a fascinating guy. But what's fascinating to me is Hamilton for my entire life, and really for 200 years after the Revolution, Hamilton was the villain of our founding story. You know, we achieved our independence as a republic and as a de democracy in spite of Hamilton, not because of him. And it's stunning, I mean, certainly when I was in high school, uh, Jefferson was the hero of the founding era, and Hamilton was the villain. And it's stunning to see the dramatic reversal that has taken place in the past 20 years, where, you know, Jefferson's fall star has fallen dramatically, and Hamilton's star has, has risen dramatically. And uh, just, it's a fascinating year. <laughs> I, I owe, Thomas Jefferson to me, one of my, hit my favorite quotes, I cannot live without books. And we have the Library of Congress to thank yeah, Thomas Library Jefferson for, right. so right. he's one of my heroes <laughs> too. Yeah. So we want to open it up for questions. Okay. Laura has a microphone and I'm gonna give this one to Mac. Okay. If you have a question, raise your hand and uh, Mac or Mara will come to you with the mic. Not a question, but I want to let people know that uh, starting Wednesday, and especially through Saturday downtown Washington, thousands and thousands of people are going to celebrate the Whiskey Rebellion uh, through street theater and, uh, and many, many uh, family-friendly uh, crafts. And, and it, 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 it's yeah, many reenactments uh, downtown uh, Washington music in the evening. Uh, it's a great event. It's 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 the largest 
I think, event in Washington County every year in terms of participation. Come and see us.
he just doesn't fit in. I mean, he was making a lot of money here. He had a large family connection here. There wasn't a lot of animus toward him before the Whiskey Rebellion, but you would think certainly after the Whiskey Rebellion, he would have been public enemy number one and not wanting to hang around here, but he did. I don't know enough about that. Boy, I don't know nothing. <laughs> That's exactly what they ended up doing. And in most places in the West, that is what they did. Uh, but when you want to make a principled stand, you know, you want to you want to win the fight. You don't want to just get away with it. They opposed the tax for principled reasons. And so they weren't going to hide. Um, other places and after, after 1794, that's exactly what they did. They took those stills and they hid them away and became moonshiners. Oh, yes. The, the taxes that they collected from this excise tax, do you know what it was used for? Did it improve the country? Great question. What was the tax used for for the whiskey? Why did Hamilton want this tax? This is a good question. And I think it is, I think it's mostly misunderstood. At least I think it's not taught exactly correctly. First of all, it's often taught that Hamilton really didn't know what he was doing, that he belonged to everything that he, uh, you know, he pushed this tax, he didn't realize it was gonna be from such a reaction here in the West. I don't believe that. Hamilton was, was like the smartest guy in the United States, literally at the time. I think he knew exactly what he was doing. I think he did want to prompt the reaction. I think he wanted to show down, prove a point. He was a very strong nationalist, a very strong federalist. He wanted to assert the supremacy and establish the principle of the supremacy of the federal government. The second thing that's misunderstood, and it's sad to say it's often printed in history books, is that Hamilton wanted to pay off our national debt with the whiskey tax. That is not the case. Uh, Hamilton wanted a national debt. He's the one who pushed for the national debt. He assumed he wanted the federal government, and he succeeded in having the federal government assume the debts left over from the revolution and the debts of the individual states, $77 million. This, this debt had been accumulated during the war, largely with what we would call war bonds. So you'd have a patriot living in, say, Western Pennsylvania, hit by, say, a $50 war bond. At the end of the war, that paper was worthless. And so speculators came around. Robert Morris was really big into this. You would hire agents to ride the country and to uh, knock on doors and say, do you have any paper? And they would bring out these old war bonds. And the guy would say, I'll pay you a penny for it and collect it just on the hope that that paper would be worth something someday. Hamilton came into office and made that paper worth face value. Not only that, but you could redeem it and uh, you, it, they would pay 6% per year on it in treasury bills. He wanted to fund the national debt, not pay it off. He wanted investors to invest in this country. Debt was useful, he said. It could get you through hard times. It could help you fight a war. Uh, it could help you do, it could, you could use it to invest in infrastructure projects that will build the economy and society. He thought debt was a very useful thing to have. And um, the whiskey excise tax, would, this is why it was so hated. This is a little bit complicated. I, I didn't get into it. But this is why it was so hated. There was a sense that Hamilton was taxing poor farmers to pay off rich investors in Britain and on the East Coast. You know, pay off investments they, his friends, investments they had made in the federal government by buying federal treasury bills. It was a transfer of wealth, and that's why Hamilton was so hated. He who would be king. He who would be king. Yeah, Hamilton uh, gave a six or seven hour lecture at, not lecture, speech, at, I give six or seven hour lectures. Uh, he gave a six or seven hour speech at the, at the Constitutional Convention. His state had left the, walked out, so he wasn't, he had no vote. Uh, he gave a very infamous speech that he spent the rest of his life living down, in which he kind of, he said, you know what we ought to do? We ought to just approximate the government of Great Britain. They have the best government in the world. We should have a monarchy, we should have senators for life, judges for life, presidents for life, and leave it at that. Man, he paid for that speech. Uh, and there's a lot of speculation about why he gave it, but he was an interesting guy. Oh, yes. 
I consider myself a, a loyal Pittsburgh area resident now, but I was raised largely in Connecticut. And some of the elements you talked about seem similar to Shay's rebellion. Is there a relationship between the two? Very much in terms of debt, yes. That's, uh, Shay's Rebellion was a rebellion uh, after the American Revolution. Shay's came first, whiskey came second, but they have very similar things in common, except that Shay's Rebellion was focused on the state of Massachusetts, on the state government. They shut down the state government and shut down the courts and shut down the, the, the state legislature. Uh, the Whiskey Rebellion was the first rebellion against the constitutional government of the United States. Those were the differences. I always understood that the reason rye was grown in western Pennsylvania instead of corn or other crops was because of the soil. Yeah. You think it grows well here? Really? Better than corn or wheat or anything else? Wheat did not grow well in this kind of soil. Very interesting. You probably can't hear that. Here you go. <laughs> I'm no farmer. Uh, I just heard that wheat doesn't grow well in soil that's just been cleared of trees, that it has to be cleared for many years. Um, yeah, and rye was a very abundant crop here, so that's why they use rye. Great. Gosh, what a smart audience. <laughs> and I, I think that just about answered all the questions. Oh, maybe we have one more. Oh, one from way up top. Yeah, way up top. Tom Tinker was a mythical figure. Okay. It was like Robin Hood. No Robin Hood really existed. Every peasant in the 1200s called themselves Robin Hood. It was a, a, a name of war, a nom de guerre. If, generally thought to be the one that was Tom the Tinker. And he was the one, sort of like the gang leader. But Tom, <laughs> you're right about Tom the Tinker was just sort of like the tag that they used. The tag line. Yeah. <laughs> that, uh, that picture that you have uh, with McFarland's uh, great uh, stone, uh, that's right, I don't know. Yeah, but we have hearing issues in this room, <laughs> I happen to know. Uh, the the uh, image that you had of uh, McFarland's uh, great stone, uh, Tom the Tinker or John Holcroft is buried about a hundred feet uh, oh, okay. from that gravesite next to his uh, second wife, and uh, it, it surprised that uh, John Holcroft could do the things that he did uh, because between his two wives, he had twenty children. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's an interesting note to end on. <laughs> oh, okay. One more. Go ahead. A, uh, a personal curiosity, because we're, we're blessed enough to live in a home where one of the uh, whiskey rebels was drug out of our front door. And I am curious to know uh, the what when they came on the night of November 11th, was it a, a bunch of horses that rode up? Uh, you know, they came in the middle of the night. What, what did the guy who lived in my house experience he here? And how did they, in where our house is, it was probably 10 miles from wherever he ended up. You know, did they just put a chain around his neck? Did they throw him in a wagon? What did they do? Uh, they, they were mainly, there probably was a horse, an officer riding a horse. The rest of the men were on, on foot. And they came with bayoneted rifles or muskets and pounded the door. In many cases, they knocked the door in. Uh, they barged in literally dragged, they wanted this to be a surprise and also this to be very dramatic. Um, uh, dragged the guy out of bed and they walked him 10 miles probably to whatever holding pen that they had. And some of these, like I said, were outdoors. Most of them were cellars or back rooms. And they were kind of kept cold and hungry for 10 days. That's why it was called the dreadful night. Definitely see why. <laughs> Well, we want to thank you again, and I, oh, go ahead. Let's, 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 let's.
So, like I said, he'll be back. Fast forward to the Vietnam War, uh, August the 23rd, and like Maura said, hopefully you can join us for November the 7th, coming up in the fall. So, once again, thank you. Stay around, check out some materials, pick up some songbooks, take a look at our panels. Thank you so much for coming, and happy 4th of July.